All right. Um, so thanks for joining me today. Um, today's talk is going to focus on the prevention of food allergy. Um, so talking about when to introduce foods, how to most safely introduce food allergens. Um, and we're going to be talking about starting in pregnancy all the way through early food introductions through infancy. I have no uh, conflicts of interest related to this talk. So our objectives for today, one is to understand key studies investigating early food introductions. Two, to review the current guidelines related to when to introduce um, common food allergens. And three, to discuss additional interventions for the prevention of food allergy. So there's a lot of things that we've been looking at in recent years as to how to prevent food allergy. Researchers have been looking at, you know, whether increases in C-sections have been causing more food allergy. What's the ideal length of breastfeeding um, versus formula introduction as it relates to, to food allergy? The timing of food introduction is what most of this talk is going to focus on, when to introduce peanuts, egg, milk, wheat. Um, does the maternal diet during pregnancy affect whether or not a child is likely to develop a food allergy? Does formula and which formula affect it? And then there's a lot of focus and thoughts and writing in recent years on the microbiome, you know, the, the bacteria that naturally live, live inside of us. Do probiotics prevent the development of food allergy? Do all those, you know, antibiotics we get affect whether or not our, our children develop food allergies? And then even eczema and skin care and whether or not good eczema care can prevent the development of food allergy. So this was a, let me try to, not sure if you guys can see this board at the top of my, my title is being blocked, but the learning early about peanut allergy trial known as the LEAP trial kind of really set things off in 2015 as getting allergists, pediatricians, parents talking about early food introduction to try to prevent food allergy. You know, 20, 25 years ago, the guidelines on peanut and tree nut allergy said, don't give peanuts and tree nuts until you're two, three years old. It wasn't really built on any guidance. You know, it, it was basically, well, some of the reactions to these foods are severe. If we don't feed them, we won't have severe reactions. So let's hold off and we'll just see when kids are older and maybe they're more able to deal with allergic reactions and, and parents are more able to pick up allergic reactions. We'll just hold off on introduction. Well, then they saw that peanut and tree nut allergies were increasing and they said, well, maybe our delayed introduction is leading to this increase in peanut and tree nut allergy. So they did away with the guideline that said, don't give peanuts you know, until you're two or three years old. But they didn't actually implement a new guideline, meaning they didn't say, well, don't just not wait till you're two or three, introduce it at six months. They just basically left no guideline for introducing peanuts and tree nuts. And so a lot of people still delayed introduction. So in 2015, this group in England came out with the results of this six-year study they did, where they were determining whether early introduction of peanut could actually prevent the development of peanut allergy in kids who were not allergic but we're at high risk for developing peanut allergy. So who's at high risk for developing food allergy? It was defined as kids who already had an egg allergy. The kids in the study either already had a reaction to egg or they were tested for egg having never eaten it and had a conclusive test um, saying that they were egg allergic or they had severe eczema, which was defined as the child needing frequent use of topical steroids to treat the eczema, um, or it was graded by a physician as being severe, which is largely based on the percent body area that was covered. Now, it's important to keep in mind as I talk about this study on early introduction preventing peanut allergy, that this was not a treatment study. If you were allergic to peanut, if you already reacted to peanut, if you had a conclusive test for peanut allergy, that those children were excluded for this study. This was entirely a prevention of peanut allergy study. So in this study, they took 319 children who were not allergic to peanut, and they told them 
to introduce, they told the parents to introduce two grams of peanut protein three times a week, starting sometime between four and 11 months when they enrolled in the study and continuing until they were five years of age. To put it in some perspective, what's two grams of peanut protein? It's about two teaspoons of peanut butter, um, or it's about 20 Bamba peanut puffs. On the flip side, 321 kids were randomized to avoid peanut. These children were told to strictly avoid introducing peanut until the children were five years old. So there's two groups that I'm gonna talk about. The first is what we call an intention to treat. That means if you were told to introduce peanut, whether you did or not, you're in this analysis. So in the intention to treat analysis on the um, left side of the screen, the uh, avoidance group, those who were told to avoid peanut, 17% of those kids became allergic by the time they were five if they were told not to introduce peanut to the diet. Keep in mind, these kids were not allergic. They were tested. They were able to eat peanut before enrolling in the study. So 17% actually became allergic to peanut by not eating it versus only 3.2% of those who were told to introduce peanut three days a week became allergic by the time they were five. So that was more than an 80% reduction. The per protocol analysis is actually analyzing the kids who actually ate peanut three days per week. Because you can imagine if you're a parent, it's not always easy to get your infant child to start eating one food on demand three days a week. Um, so in those who were actually able to follow the protocol and give the peanut at least two times a week, only 0.3% became allergic to peanut by five years old versus 17% of those high-risk kids who were told to avoid. So this study definitively concluded that in infants who were at high risk for peanut allergy, but were not allergic, peanut introduction between four and 11 months resulted in a significant reduction in peanut allergy prevalence by the time those children turned five years old. So the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease in 2017 came out with these guidelines that said, if you have severe eczema, if you have an egg allergy or both, you should strongly consider getting tested for peanut allergy, either by blood or skin testing. And if necessary, the allergist should perform an oral food challenge. If the testing is inconclusive, bring the child into the office, feed them peanut slowly over typically about an hour and watch them for two hours to make sure they're not allergic. And based on the testing, they recommended introducing peanut containing foods in those children between four and six months of age. Their second guideline said that if you have mild to moderate eczema, so not the severe eczema that was considered a major risk factor, but some eczema may be your risk for being an allergic child, they recommended also introducing peanut containing foods around six months of age, but they didn't recommend testing those children for peanut allergy. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the coming slides. Their third guideline was pretty vague, which said if you have no eczema, you have no food allergy, you have no allergic problems, you can introduce peanut foods kind of when you want, in an age appropriate manner, they said, in accordance with family preferences and your culture. Um, so they really left it up to the parents, if you weren't at risk for food allergy, whether or not you introduced peanut early. Now, there were several concerns regarding the recommendations. The first was classifying severe eczema is very subjective. So if you're going to tell everybody if you have severe eczema, you should go to the allergist for testing, you know, that could lead to over referrals. I can tell you from personal experience as a parent, you know, judging your own child's severity of eczema is very different than what the allergist or the dermatologist might call severe eczema. You know, this is really an objective measure when you go to the dermatologist based on the percent of your skin that's covered, how strong the topical steroid to treat it is. But when you're watching your own child scratch even mild eczema, it can feel very severe to you. Um, now, one thing that parents ask, well, why don't we just do a big panel of testing on everybody? You know, why don't we identify everyone who's allergic, 
and tell them to avoid peanuts and egg and milk and wheat before we ever introduce it to the diet. Well, the problem with food allergy testing is on the good side, it's very good at identifying allergy. If you are allergic, it's very, very rare that you get a negative test, meaning that the skin test doesn't pop up or the blood test says you don't have an allergy. But on the flip side, there are a lot of false positives, meaning there are a lot of kids who are not allergic who will also have positive tests, either a positive skin test or an elevated blood test to a food. In studies from the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, about 10% of children will show a positive test, either skin test or blood test to peanut, while only one to 2% of those populations actually has a peanut allergy. So you might end up, if you're not doing food challenges after the testing, if you're testing a lot of children, you're obviously gonna diagnose a lot of children with peanut allergy who maybe don't have that allergy and you're gonna cut it out of the diet unnecessarily. In Australia, in their study, it was estimated that 29% of this, those screened with blood testing would require follow-up um, for positive testing. It also said that, you know, unfortunately, if you restrict your testing to just the high-risk kids, there are still some kids who will be missed, meaning some kids who don't have eczema, some kids who don't have egg, egg allergy will still be allergic to peanut. They said of the you know, kids who have a peanut allergy, you know, about 23% don't come from the high risk group. So the majority do, but still there are some children without bad eczema, without other food allergies, who will have a peanut allergy. Now, what are the potential barriers to implementing the guidelines? Well, when they surveyed in 2018, pediatricians and allergists, the main limitation was concern for reactions. You know, the pediatrician, the allergist can tell parents, you know, your kid is not at risk for peanut allergy. You should introduce it at home. But if the parent is afraid to do that, well, it's not going to happen. We're not going to prevent the food allergy. So in those cases, maybe testing for peanut is helpful. Um, now, one of the, the, obviously the major concern, both by pediatricians and allergists that was reported for not being able to implement the guidelines on early introduction of peanut was concern for allergic reactions. No one wants to tell the six or seven month old to eat peanut and have that allergic reaction in that beautiful little baby at home. But on the flip side, studies have shown that if you do introduce the foods in infancy, infants are actually at lower risk than older kids to have a severe reaction to the food. So it was much more likely in infants who had an allergic reaction to a food, whether it was egg or milk or peanut, they were much more likely to have symptoms like a rash or hives or itchiness um, compared to the older kids who were more likely to have respiratory symptoms, trouble breathing, wheezing, throat tightening. And so you were actually at lower risk for severe reactions introducing the food early. So even if they react, maybe it's not as bad. They found less biphasic reactions, less hospitalizations in infancy. Biphasic reactions are reactions where a severe reaction occurs, goes away with treatment, and then comes back when the medicines wear off. So that was more likely to happen in older kids than in infants. And talking about extremes, Death from the first invention in ingestion of a food during infancy has not been described. Um, you know, it's extremely rare in older kids as well, but unfortunately that has happened, but that has not been reported in with first ingestions during early infancy. So, you know, the newer real world data talking about milder severity of reactions can be reassuring to parents, um, you know, who are reluctant to introduce foods early in infancy. So we've talked a bunch about peanut. Now the EAT trial, inquiring about tolerance, um, looked at other common food allergy ingestions and whether or not early introduction could prevent food allergy. This was the same group in the United Kingdom um, performing this study. They were looking at whether or not early feeding of cow's milk, you know, and when I say early, they started between three and six months of age. They started with cow's milk. They then proceeded to peanut, 
cooked egg, sesame, whitefish, and wheat in these children. They were recommending two grams of protein twice per week um, of each of these foods. To put it in some perspective, I mentioned two grams of peanut protein is about two teaspoons of peanut butter. That's about one slice of Wonder Bread um, for wheat. For sesame, it's about two teaspoons of tahini. So you can imagine if you're introducing all of these foods between three and six months of age, it's gonna be a lot for these young infants to eat. Um, so they had half the children in the study, you know, who, and everyone in the study was breastfeeding at the time um, when they were recruited at three months. So half the kids, they said, you know, you can continue breastfeeding, but add these foods to the diet. And then the other half, they said, continue to exclusively breastfeed until six months of age. After six months of age, the parents were told, you can consume these allergens whenever, however you want. The primary outcome of the study was whether or not the children became allergic to one of the six foods between one and three years of age. So for peanut, in their, and, and these kids were not at high risk for, for allergy. I should have mentioned that. So this was not the group with bad eczema or egg allergy. This was the general population. Um, so in this population, it was about 2.5% of the kids who were told to exclusively breastfeed um, became allergic to peanut at some point between one and three years of age versus only 1.2% of those who were told to introduce peanut early. Now, this was the intention to treat, meaning they were told to introduce peanut, but maybe they didn't. In those who were actually introducing those two grams of peanut at least twice a week, they found zero were allergic to peanut um, between one and three years of old, one and three years of age, versus 2.5% of those who were told to exclusively breastfeed. So again, we saw that significant reduction in peanut allergy with early introduction. With egg, they saw a similar thing. In the group, there was less egg allergy and those who were told to introduce egg between three and six months, not a significant, a huge decrease, not a what we call significant difference, meaning it could have been due to chance that there were less kids allergic to egg between one and three and those were told who were told to eat it. But they saw a much bigger reduction in egg allergy in those who were actually able to introduce egg to the diet um, twice a week in those two gram doses. It was 1.4% of those who were told to eat egg versus 5.5% of those who were told to avoid egg um, became allergic at some point between when they were tested between one and three years of age. So the conclusion was early introduction of cooked egg was safe and it was associated with significantly lower prevalence of egg allergy when the kids got a little bit older. They did not see any significant effects with respect to milk sesame, fish, or wheat, you know, part of it might be it was hard to get kids between three and six months of age to eat two grams of fish twice a week, or sesame, you know, tahini twice a week, especially when you're doing egg and milk and peanut. Um, they did find that partial adherence was not associated with an increase in prevalence of allergy, meaning if you tried to introduce these foods at four to six months, but you were unable to keep it going, you weren't putting your kid at risk for developing an allergy. You weren't causing an allergy by doing that. So it was safe to try these foods. Even if you couldn't keep it up, you weren't doing harm. And they found that the early introduction of foods did not affect growth and it did not affect the duration of breastfeeding. You know, one of the concerns of pediatricians and allergists is we know that there are many beneficial effects of breastfeeding, you know, on preventing infections, on preventing obesity, on development of wheezing as kids get older. Um, but introducing these foods did not cause parents to stop breastfeeding. You know, 98% of those who were told to breastfeed exclusively um, until six months, you know, were still doing it versus 97% of those who were told to introduce the foods early were still breastfeeding by six months of age. There have been a lot of studies looking at egg introduction since. Um, overall, the studies have shown that in five different trials, enrolling over almost 2,000 kids and telling them to introduce egg early, that early introduction of egg between four and six months is associated with a reduction in egg allergy. 
There have been a lot of mixed results with milk introduction early. You know, one study from 2020 showed that if you introduced cow's milk based formula as a supplement to breastfeeding between one and two months of age, they did find a significant reduction in milk allergy as the children got older. 0.8% of those who were told to do that versus 6.8%, um, you know, in those who, who exclusively breastfed. Um, there was another study in 2019 that actually showed if you did milk-based formula in the first few days of life, they actually found it harmful. They found avoidance of cow's milk-based formula in the first few days of life um, could actually, um, you know, avoiding it could actually help prevent the development of egg, uh, milk allergy. Um, the EAT study that we just talked about, you know, where they did all the different allergens between three and six months of age, they found no significant effects with milk. Um, and that was similar to a study in 2011 that compared kids getting soy formula to milk formula and found that not getting milk formula did not um, lead to more milk allergy as kids got older. So overall, the studies on milk, you know, are inconclusive. I think further studies are needed. Um, before we tell people whether or not they should or shouldn't introduce milk early in life. So after all of these studies in 2020, the governing bodies of allergy and immunology put together some more guidelines. And they said that there's strong evidence that early introduction of peanut and egg within the first year of life can prevent the development of those allergies. They said, try to introduce them around six months of age, but not before four months of age. And in talking about amounts, they said use only cooked forms of egg, not raw egg, um, which might seem silly, but it has to be said. And they recommended an amount of about one third of a cooked egg. They said that screening infants for evidence of allergy, meaning performing allergy tests like skin tests or blood tests to peanut or egg before the initial introduction is not required, though it might be necessary based on family preference. If you have a parent who's nervous because maybe they have a peanut allergy, or maybe the sibling has a peanut allergy. You know, those studies have shown that if there's a family member with peanut allergy, that delays the introduction of peanut due to fear. And so maybe it's better to test those kids so you don't have that delay. But they did say to encourage home introduction, especially if the testing was negative. They did say that if you do perform testing, you should consider offering food challenges, bringing the child into the office, feeding them the food slowly over an hour and watching them for two hours to determine conclusively whether or not they're actually allergic to the food. And while they haven't had studies that show benefit to early introduction of other allergens like milk and, and wheat and sesame, they said there's no data suggesting that early introduction around six months is harmful. And there is observational data that suggests there is harm from intentional delayed introduction of those foods. So how much do infants need to eat when you're introducing these foods at six months of age? Um, peanut, the recommendation is about one to two teaspoons of peanut butter or peanut powder per serving, served two to three times per week. With egg, it's about one third of a well-cooked egg, two to three times per week. And the guidelines say that there's insufficient evidence to support precise dosing. So you don't have to sit there with scales measuring milligrams and things like that. But their panel recommended parents focusing on feeding amounts and types of peanut or egg that their child likes and will tolerate with some frequency, such as one to two teaspoons of peanut butter. Um, the child could eat more if they like it. Um, but what you don't want is, let's say your child is willing to eat one teaspoon of peanut butter and not two. You don't wanna try forcing them to do two teaspoons of peanut butter because then they learn to fight and then they don't wanna even eat the one teaspoon of peanut butter and it becomes hard to get any peanut into the diet. So, you know, if your child is willing to eat one teaspoon of peanut butter, but not two, one is better than nothing. And in thinking, you know, peanut butter is thick, it's a choking hazard. So how do we safely introduce it? Well, we mix it with warm water to, basically make it like all the other soft pureed foods that babies eat and infants eat. So you can take your Bamba puffs and mix them with water. Um, 20 Bamba puffs with four to six teaspoons of warm water will kind of make it a uh, similar consistency to other fruit purees that they're eating at the time. Um, 
This is the one that I tend to prefer because it's simpler, I think, and cheaper. Um, mixing two teaspoons of peanut butter with two to three teaspoons of warm water. Um, and it, again, becomes a consistency that they're able to tolerate at six months of age. So a lot of patients these days ask me about these products that like are, you know, puffs and things that you can deliver all nine major allergens in one little puff um, and, and introduce all of these foods early in a manner that, that's easy. It's simple. Now, what's wrong with it? Well, the cost, these products can be very expensive. Um, it can be convenient for families not to have to prepare the foods. But the biggest problem I have with these products is that some of these products have very little of each protein in them, meaning like a puff that has peanut and sesame and cashews and walnuts and egg and milk and, and, and wheat and fish and, and shrimp in it. Well, it might only have one tenth of one peanut. Now, does that prevent the development of peanut allergy? I would say there's no evidence for that. You know, we looked at giving two grams of peanut, the equivalent of eight peanuts, you know, twice per week. Is giving a tenth of a peanut going to prevent peanut allergy? Well, in our experience, and my colleague at Mount Sinai wrote up this paper, we have seen allergic reactions to these products. We've also seen allergic reactions when the actual food is introduced, meaning they were like kids were having these you know, puffs, these products with multiple allergens, and then they actually tried an egg, or they actually tried peanut, and they had an allergic reaction. Why is that? Well, sometimes there's a threshold that a child can tolerate. A, to a child might be able to tolerate one twentieth of one cashew, but if they eat one full cashew, they might actually have an allergic reaction. And so no evidence that this will, will prevent allergy. My other problem with the product is if you have any food allergy and you try this product, you're going to have an allergic reaction because it has every major allergen in it, you know. Um, so you also won't know if you're introducing, let's say, 10 allergens at a time and your child has an allergic reaction, which allergen triggered the reaction. And now you're stuck avoiding all of these allergens until you could perform testing and things like that. So, you know. Certainly, I don't think there's any evidence to recommend the commercial early introduction products um, as opposed to just introducing a cooked scrambled egg or a little yogurt for milk or peanut butter. Now, who should definitely be tested in my mind for allergy? So if you already have a food allergy, you should probably be tested um, and see an allergist. Um, and you don't have to wait till you're a year or two years of age. I know those myths are out there. You can be evaluated by an allergist early in life at four months, at six months. That is perfectly fine. Now, if, for example, you have a peanut allergy, I usually test for tree nut allergies. Why? Because almost 35% of kids with a peanut allergy will have at least one tree nut allergy. Um, if you have, for example, a cow's milk allergy, more than 90% will have a sheep's milk or a goat's milk allergy. And, you know, if you're allergic to um, a food like soy, more than 75% will have a peanut allergy. So, you know, there are certain correlations that we know of that put people at high risk for other allergies. I think it's important to discuss that with your allergist before moving on to other common allergens, especially when there is cross-reactivity. So, if you get diagnosed with a food allergy, my recommendation is to see an allergist early. Don't put it off until you're one or two years old so that you can be guided as far as what's safe to introduce. Um, exclusive breastfeeding has not shown evidence of preventing food allergy in multiple studies. Um, we do know that breastfeeding, again, can prevent you know, for example, um, the development of wheezing as kids get older. It can prevent obesity but it does not unfortunately prevent the development of food allergy. Um, there is no evidence that a mother who is breastfeeding, um, cutting things from her diet or when pregnant, um, cutting things from the diet will prevent the development of atopic diseases like food allergy um, or asthma or eczema. So, you know, a lot of parents who have a child with food allergy will come in, you know, trying to figure out why it happened. And, and the most common thing I hear is, is this because I ate so much peanut butter while I was pregnant? And the answer is no, 
you didn't cause the allergy. There's no evidence that what you ate while you were pregnant or breastfeeding caused the allergy. Um, so no, not your fault. Um, there was actually one study from, from Harvard that showed a slight decrease in peanut allergy when um, mothers uh, who were expecting uh, had peanut during, in their diet during the first trimester. There are ongoing studies looking at this further, actually like randomizing certain mothers to ingest large amounts of foods like six eggs or 60 peanuts per week from 22 weeks of pregnancy to four months. We don't have the results of these um, studies yet. No evidence that vitamin supplements um, or vitamin D supplements uh, will prevent the development of food allergy. Um, there is a lot of studies looking at probiotics right now. So far, we haven't seen reductions in food allergy development or resolution with the addition of probiotics. Now, I say so far because you know, there's a lot of theories about, again, the microbiome, the way we break down our foods, the hygiene hypothesis, that we're too clean. We don't expose our kids to enough germs. And so the immune system overreacts to an egg or to sesame or to a cashew or walnut. Um, but, you know, so far we haven't seen giving probiotics to help. That doesn't mean maybe we haven't found the right dose of the bacteria in those probiotics. Maybe we haven't found the right bacteria. Um, and so, you know, there are studies looking at different doses and different uh, probiotics going on at this time. Um, and so I think the jury is still out on that one at this time. I don't tell people specifically to take probiotics to prevent food allergy. Um, this is an interesting study going on at Mount Sinai right now. Um, if you happen to be pregnant and you are planning to deliver by C-section and you are delivering at Mount Sinai, you can actually participate in this study. Um, it's actually looking at whether or not C-sections are leading to um, more allergy and more food allergy. Um, and basically what they're doing is they're taking the um, children, the, the infants delivered by C-section, and in half of them, they're gonna swab the vaginal canal and then swab the baby to give that bacterial exposure because that is the first bacterial exposure is, is vaginal birth versus a C-section is more of a sterile field. Um, and in half the children, they're just going to observe, they're not gonna swab them. Um, and they're gonna see if giving that bacterial exposure after the C-section um, can result in, in fewer food allergies over time. Um, if someone is pregnant and planning to deliver by C-section, you could see at the bottom left corner of the slide, you can email or call um, to participate in what's known as the ACTIVATE study. There's also a study called the Sunbeam trial going on at Mount Sinai, and this is a multi-center study looking at food allergy and eczema development. It is looking at a variety of clinical, environmental, biologic, genetic, early life factors to try to determine what we can do to prevent more allergy, what is leading to the increases in allergy we've seen in recent years. Um, this one, you also have to be delivering at Mount Sinai Hospital, um, but if you are, and you are inter uh, interested um, in participating in this study, you can email sunbeam at mssm.edu. So take home points before I start to answer your questions. You know, one, testing results in many false positives. So big allergy panels are not harmless. Um, so, you know, testing every child for food allergy can do harm before introducing. And that's important to keep mind in mind as a parent. You know, if you're nervous about introducing these foods, just keep in mind if we do go to the allergist and we do perform testing, sometimes we can cut out foods unnecessarily. Um, that doesn't mean that no one should be tested again if you already have a food allergy. If a fear of allergy is delaying introduction, it might be beneficial to test and try to get these foods in more, more quickly. Early introduction, starting at four to six months of age of egg and peanut, have been shown to reduce the development of these food allergies and is to be encouraged. Now, one thing to keep in mind with that, I'd never make peanut or egg the first food that I introduce, largely because sometimes kids spit up, they choke, they're not used to, you know, 
processing solid foods. So I still start with like those stage one baby foods, those like green and yellow and orange vegetables that are pureed. Make sure you see what your child is like swallowing solid foods, because what you don't want is your child chokes on a peanut the first time you introduce it and you think it's anaphylaxis um, or a severe food allergic reaction. Um, so usually not the first foods I introduce. Usually I try to get at least, you know, two or three other foods in before moving on to common allergens. Prevention of other food allergies other than peanut and egg may occur with early introduction, but additional studies are needed. While concern for reactions was cited as the top barrier to early introduction, early introduction of food allergens appears safe. It is associated with a lower rate of severe allergic reactions when someone does react. Early introduction of foods does not negatively affect rates of breastfeeding. These guidelines are constantly being updated based on new studies. So if I give you this talk in another year, we might have different things to recommend. Um, and there is currently insufficient evidence that skin emollients, vitamin supplements, maternal elimination diets are protective, um, but st further studies are underway looking at those things. So thank you for your time. Um, if you want to schedule an appointment, you know, with an allergist, either at Mount Sinai, um, where there are 11 of us who focus on food allergies at Valley, um, there's two of us. Um, these are the phone numbers to schedule an appointment. If you just want to follow us on Facebook or on Instagram, um, or just be part of our research newsletter mailing list, um, the contact information is right here. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Great. So we had two great questions come in. If one child has a food allergy, is there a greater chance that your second child will have it as well? That is a very good question. And, it, and it's not an easy one to answer. And the, the very simple answer is, is yes, that, that that child is more likely to have a food allergy, but it's based on small studies. Now, there was one study that looked at in, uh, the development of peanut allergy in young, younger siblings. And while about 2% of the general population is found to have a peanut allergy, they found about 8% um, of the younger siblings had a peanut allergy. So clearly 8% is bigger than 2%. You know, not 50%, not 90%, so certainly not the majority, but a slightly increased um, prevalence. Now, the reason I say it's a little bit complicated, this was also a study that occurred before the LEAP trial, before we started recommending early introduction. And this study did not show whether or not this was a biologic risk, or maybe there were other factors involved. So I'd be curious to see, because we do know that younger siblings are less likely to get peanut early in life, largely because the parents understandably are nervous about introducing peanut, you know, when the older sibling was allergic, or maybe they've cut it out from the home. So they don't even wanna have it in the house in case that child touches it or grabs it from their younger sibling. So maybe it's delaying the introduction in those younger siblings that led to that increase, that 8% who became allergic. Um, so. I do think that there's probably a slight increase in, in food allergy in the younger siblings. Again, it's not the majority who will be allergic. I would say that if the younger sibling has severe eczema, I would certainly test them knowing the older sibling was allergic and this is clearly maybe an allergic child. I think it's more questionable. Let's say the older sibling has peanut allergy. Maybe that child also had wheezing. Maybe that child also had bad eczema. And now the second child or the third child, they just come out and they have beautiful skin and they don't get rashy at all. Maybe that child isn't at risk for food allergy. So maybe testing them is could do more harm than good. So this is a complicated way of saying, I would take it on a case by case basis. I would say certainly if a parent is very nervous about introducing a food like peanut or sesame or tree nut because the older sibling is allergic. And that fear is going to lead to delayed introduction that we know can then cause more food allergy. Then you should bring them in and have them tested because it can't do any harm to test if they're already avoiding the food. Um, and maybe 
introducing it early can prevent the development of those allergies. Great, thank you. We have one more. Um, folks, if you have more questions, send them my way. Um, the next question is, my husband was diagnosed later in life with celiac. Is that, an al is that allergy genetic? Um, the term allergy, I don't usually apply to celiac. Um, when I talk about allergy as an allergist, I tend to talk more about the kind of reactions where somebody eats a food and it's caused by the allergic antibodies, what we call IgE in the body, that lead to symptoms such as immediate hives, um, vomiting, coughing, trouble breathing, a tightened airway, uh, an immediate life-threatening reaction. And those reactions tend to happen very quickly after eating the food. Um, versus, you know, I tend to talk about celiac. Yes, you could define it as an allergy or an intolerance, but it's not going to cause immediate or life-threatening reactions. Now, that is managed more by gastroenterologists. It causes more of an inflammation in the intestines that can cause a lot of pain, weight loss, um, abnormal stooling. There is an increased risk um, genetically with celiac disease. Um, typically, the pediatricians can send a blood test if they're concerned that is a screening test, meaning it's very good at ruling out celiac disease. But if it's positive, then usually you have to go to a gastroenterologist and do an endoscopy and take biopsies to confirm that diagnosis. So that's not something done by allergists. Um, so, you know, yes, there is an increased risk in family members of celiac disease if there is a family member, um, but it's not something that I manage as an allergist. And it doesn't put you at risk for having a typical food allergy. Um, do you think there is a connection between IVF and eczema slash food allergies? Um, I've seen no evidence for it, you know, in certain birth cohorts that have been studied. Um, but it's, again, one of the things I think there is certainly more IVF than there was 30 years ago. It's, you know, one of the many things that they're looking at in that national cohort that's included at Mount Sinai um, to see if there are any risks. But, you know, both scientifically and observationally, and, and based on prior small studies, I haven't seen that risk. Um, and sorry, unrelated to that, I also want to mention because I didn't mention this during the talk, we talked about early introduction of foods like peanut and milk and egg. You know, I want to stress that it's not just early introduction, but early introduction and continued incorporation of the food in the diet that prevents allergy. It does not help the child to introduce peanut at six months, do it till you're eight months, and then cut it out for four months. I've seen a handful of patients who have had allergic reactions when they tried it six months after not eating it, even if they did introduce it early. So when we talk about early introduction, I think too often allergists and pediatricians don't use the words early introduction and continued incorporation of foods like peanut and egg. Great. Um, if a child tests positive for a number of allergens, dairy, eggs, soy, peanut, tree nuts, could that be a warning sign for an autoimmune issue? Um, it's a good question. It's not something that we've seen. We haven't seen, even if you have true allergy, forget positive testing. You know, we don't see increases in, in autoimmune issues in our food allergic patients. And many of our patients have multiple food allergies. You know, I would also be cautious to say, sometimes we send panels of testing even to foods you're not allergic to. Um, so if somebody sent a panel of testing on your child and your child was eating a food with no problem, you know, usually that's not allergy. That's a false positive test. You know, if, when you come into our office, if you tell me that your child is eating eggs with no problem, but you're worried about a reaction to peanut, I'm not going to test for egg because potentially I can cut it out. What's the best test for food allergy that I mentioned? the food challenge where we bring you into the office, we only feed you the food once and we watch you for two hours. And if you don't react, we say you're not allergic. So if you're already eating a food at home and someone did a panel of testing and it has a lot of positives, you know, 
it certainly could be a false positive. And we also see sometimes kids who have bad eczema, they just have a lot of these allergic cells in their body. They're, they're more likely to have false positives on like a blood test. And so sometimes it, it doesn't necessarily show a risk of autoimmune disorder. It can show that you just have a lot of allergic cells, maybe due to something like eczema or in an older kid, seasonal allergy that can falsely elevate numbers to foods. Um, but no, we haven't seen a risk with autoimmune disease or like internal inflammation based on positive testing for allergy. Okay, one last question. Can you talk a little bit more about what we can do if we got a positive blood test for peanuts? I believe you mentioned food trials. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously my first recommendation is if it was done by a pediatrician, go to an allergist. Now, I mentioned that there are a lot of false positives, but at the same time, the bigger the skin test or the higher the blood test, the more likely it is a true allergy. So for example, in a blood test, the numbers can go as, le as low as less than 0.1, that's de undetectable if it's less than 0.1, and they can go as high as saying greater than 100. If it's above 100, they don't give us the number in what they call the IgE to these foods, the allergic antibodies. So if somebody comes to me with a number of 20 to peanut, I'm not going to perform a food challenge because that number is high enough to tell me there's more than a 95% chance that that child is allergic, even if they've never eaten the food. Now, if you come in with that peanut test saying 0.3 and I do a skin test and it's pretty small, there might be a 90% chance that the child is not allergic. And then I will recommend a food challenge. So you know, I certainly think it warrants a skin test. Um, it warrants a discussion, you know, with the allergist based on how high the number is will help determine whether or not the child needs a food challenge. Food challenges are not done to prove an allergy. If there's a convincing history of a reaction to a food, if the number is so high that it tells us there's a 95% chance you're allergic, you know, we don't bring in a hundred kids to find the maybe one or two who don't have an allergic reaction. And, and we don't watch 98 of them have allergic reactions that potentially could be severe. But if the numbers say certainly there's more than a 50% chance you're not allergic, then we might be inclined to offer that food challenge.